Let us begin the final plenary session of, within the conference. It will include four chosen themes of interest for future ed education. The lectures will not be related directly to education, but we hope it will be of interest to you, first of all, and then for future education. I'm asking uh, Dr. Alexander Karpov from the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, Dubna, Russia, to be the first speaker. Thank you. It works, yeah? Thank you very much for the possibility to come here, first of all, and to give this talk. I'm not completely sure why the subject was uh, chosen, but I think I know. Yeah? That is uh, probably because of uh, Dmitry Mendeleev, yeah, who made his uh, great discovery exactly 150 years ago, a uh, periodic law uh, of change of chemical properties of elements, uh, and uh, write down his famous uh, periodic table of elements, which was, was very successful and so successful that uh, even now, after a great transformation and growth of the table, we still call it Mendeleev periodic table. Uh, and I think that is the reason why, uh, simultaneously, UNESCO and United Nations uh, proclaim this year as an international year of the periodic table, which is quite widely uh, celebrated all over the world, in, uh, in Russia, of course, uh, in particular. But uh, opening was in Paris, in uh, headquarters of UNESCO, and closing will be in two weeks in, uh, in Tokyo, and in between many, many, many events. Well, so in those time, I mean, in the period of Mendeleev, uh, periodic table uh, contained 63 elements. Now it's uh, almost twice bigger, so we have uh, uh, nearly uh, 120, exactly 119 elements. And periodic table now looks uh, extremely complete. And uh, yeah, just I think that this shape of this table is perfect. Because we have a fully complete seven periods, seven rows of the periodic table. All elements of these seven rows are known. Uh, all of them are named, uh, so that is the uh, first time in the history w w when it is in this shape. And if uh, any new element uh, will appear, I think this will disturb this perfect shape and it will never be uh, in, in, uh, again in such shape in, in the future. Well, uh, since uh, we speak about uh, not natural elements, but elements which we uh, uh, produce artificially. By the way, that is element above uh, uranium, element 92. Uh, all of those elements were uh, produced uh, with the nuclear methods, with the method of nuclear reactions. And that in this uh, respect, we should remember one more date, uh, 1919, exactly 100 years ago, one first nuclear reaction was uh, made. That was Ernest Rutherford. So, a uh, hundred years uh, ago, mankind knew how to transform one nucleus uh, or one element to another, so we are, we are alchemists already 100 years. Yeah? Uh, oops, something happened. Well, so, uh, if you look to the chart of nuclei, to our material world, we see that, uh, first of all, uh, elements which we have on the Earth, there are about 300, all of them are stable or nearly stable, and the heaviest uh, one, which is radioactive but quite stable, that is uranium, which is here, absolutely stable, that is lead, and that is here. Uh, uh, total number of known nuclei, that is 350, and people think that the number of nuclei which may exist, that is twice more than 7,000, 7, uh, this our material world is limited, so not, not any combination of neutrons and protons can be a nucleus. And uh, this border exists uh, to, on the, our right hand, on our left hand, and should be also the border on the top. So somewhere should be the last, the heaviest uh, element in the periodic table, and we cannot produce elements 
infinitely in the future. So, so somewhere should be a limit. And of course, this, uh, to reach this limit and to, uh, uh, how to say, close the question about existence of elements, existence of nuclei, is quite interesting and quite, quite topical. Well, uh, in particular, why, why this topic about heavy elements is so important, and especially important in uh, recent uh, years, that is uh, because, in, at least, uh, in fact, we uh, knew uh, at least 20 years ago quite, uh, quite uh, uh, small, inf we had quite small information about how elements appeared in, in the universe. So we knew how the uh, first two elements appeared after Big Bang, then we know uh, uh, the, the method of production of elements up to, uh, uh, up to iron. Uh, that is, happens in uh, stars, but we uh, didn't know uh, exactly how elements heavier than element 26 were produced. We know that they exist, uh, a lot of them, we made of these elements, but what we didn't know how they were produced in the universe. And that is a question which was uh, marked as a question number three of uh, 11th greatest unanswered questions in physics uh, in 2002. Uh, at the moment, at the moment, since 20 years, almost 20 years, uh, we think we know how it was made, but we are still not sure where it, it happened. And uh, what was uh, extremely important in the recent years for this topic, that is discovery of gravitational waves, which is not uh, directly connected with the subject of uh, nuclear synthesis, but this gives us a method, a method to uh, record and to study uh, very uh, rare and very uh, how to, dramatic uh, uh, things which happen in the universe. Uh, for example, that is neutron star merge, which produce uh, gravitational waves, and this gives rise to the new, uh, new uh, direction in the science, which is called in the astronomy, that which is called multi-message astronomy. And I think that is, uh, uh, this method in very soon future, very, uh, very soon it gives us understanding how elements are produced, at least up to uranium. Uh, uranium is the heaviest, is the heaviest which we have on the Earth. But uh, fortunately or unfortunately our Earth is first of all is quite old and we have uh, only elements uh, in, on the Earth which uh, survived uh, to the present days. So our Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Uh, also, uh, our uh, system uh, is very far from any dramatic events in the universe, and that is, I think, fortunate yeah? for people, but not, not but unfortunate for uh, scientists. Uh, so we are not able to uh, observe uh, um, uh, consequences of, uh, I don't know, explosions of stars and so on uh, uh, directly. Well, uh, so that is the reason why he is u only uranium. But in fact, of course, uh, that is not the limit. And uh, as in the laboratories and in the universe especially, uh, elements heavier than uranium are produced. The question is, of course, uh, where is the limit? A limit of possibilities of the uh, nature and the, our limits in the laboratories to, to, uh, to come to the end uh, of the periodic table. Uh, 70 years ago, there was a common opinion when people uh, start to produce uh, elements uh, above uranium and came to element 100. Uh, they saw a d dramatic decrease of stability of uh, those elements and uh, there was a common opinion that limit of existence of elements that is approximately element 104, 105. Uh, and the reason uh, of that is this uh, extreme instability of the nucleus uh, with respect to spontaneous fission, the process which was discovered by Georgi Florov in 1940. Uh, Approximately 20 years after, uh, people uh, finally recognized that nucleus 
is a quantum system and therefore it is, has this internal structure. And this internal structure, of course, of course influences the stability of the nucleus. And instead of that, this uh, quite simple picture with the continent ending up with the lead, with some peninsula, with thorium and uranium, we have a more complicated structure with uh, some islands and shoals. And uh, by the way, this uh, was first predict predicted in Dubna in the same year in Frankfurt in Germany. And it was predicted that if we uh, succeed to come to extremely heavy nuclei, super heavy nuclei, in the vicinity of proton number 114 and neutron number 184, so there will be an island which was named Island of Stability of Super Heavy Elements. And in the top of this island, uh, elements may live extremely long. So first predictions were billions of years. So now realistic predictions say that this is thousands of years, but still it is a lot. It is a lot in comparison with uh, um, uh, half-lives of the element uh, around uh, element 100, where we have minutes or seconds, or even microseconds, or milliseconds. Well, uh, immediately after that, there was a, a number of attempts to discover this island of stability, to produce super heavy elements in all leading laboratories in the world, including, of course, the United States, uh, Dubna, Germany, France, Switzerland, later on Japan, and so on. This was for 15 or even 20 years, and unfortunately, yes, and uh, uh, methods which were used, there are numerous of methods, so people try to find uh, uh, this, those elements in nature, on the Earth, or in lunar objects, in cosmic rays. They made uh, the use high flux reactors, or even nuclear explosions to produce uh, super heavy elements, use accelerators, uh, develop very complicated and sophisticated methods uh, for detecting and uh, separation of those elements. But unfortunately, uh, during all this period, the super heavy elements uh, which are close to the island of stability were not found. Uh, it was also understood that the problem of artificial synthesis of super heavy elements, it is she, uh, is related to the reaction of synthesis. So it's, uh, many reactions were tested and uh, people finally understood approximately what kind of reaction should be chosen for the most uh, efficient uh, synthesis of elements. Uh, thus, in, in Dubna, in the beginning of 90s, uh, it was understood that the only method which may lead to success that is the use of the reaction of calcium-48, calcium, but very rare and, and uh, quite expensive isotope of calcium, and actinides as a reaction to produce super heavy elements, and that is the last hope to make this. If it will be not successful, so uh, probably uh, it will not be successful in, in the next generations as well. And uh, what was done? So all our equipment which we had uh, in, uh, in to the 90s, it was uh, modernized. And modernized in this way that it, it became better, a thousand times better than what we had before. So it was indeed great work. And that is work uh, not only of uh, our laboratory, but that is uh, indeed a big task to, to make uh, this experiment successful. First of all, uh, what we need, we need actinides, and we need uh, actinides which don't exist on the Earth. So we need actinides which are produced uh, in the nuclear reactors artificially. And there's two, two in the world, there are only two reactors which may produce those uh, materials in sufficient quantities. So one is in the United States in Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and another one is in Dimitrovgrad, Ulyanovsk region, which is in Russia. And these two uh, centers uh, supply us with uh, the target material which, uh, which was uh, needed for such type of experiments. Uh, just to give you an example, that was, uh, you see, uh, uh, 22 milligrams of berkelium, element num number 97, which led to the discovery of element 117. It was produced in Oak Ridge in uh, state Tennessee, USA, and what you see here is a small green drop that is uh, annual production of this element. 
with, uh, with this, that reactor. So you understand that how, how difficult it is and uh, how much it may cost even. Yeah? Uh, and uh, yeah, just to give you some uh, numbers which are feasible, for example, element 97 and 98 can be produced in tens of milligrams. If we uh, want to use element 99, uh, Einsteinium, that is only micrograms. And if we uh, want to use I uh, sorry, uh, fermium, uh, so that is less than nanogram. Uh, and this uh, amount of material, tens of milligrams, is minimum amount which we need to make a target. Target, by the way, looks like that. So that is a rotating target with a foil uh, covered by the target material, uh, irradiated by the beam, very high-intensity high, high beam uh, of calcium-48. And calcium-48 is also, it's also not a simple task. It's not a usual calcium, but uh, quite rare isotope, which exists in, uh, in, in nature, but it's very difficult and expensive to separate it from the, uh, all other isotopes of calcium. In fact, annual production is just 10 to 12 grams, and that is uh, only one center in the world which produces this isotope. It is in Russia, in uh, North Ural Mountains, uh, city Lesnoy, and the... Uh, very big task for us was to uh, uh, modernize our equipment for very efficient use of this uh, small amount of material in this way that the annual production uh, fit uh, one year work of the accelerator. So we should uh, consume in, uh, this calcium in this way, so this uh, 12 grams would be enough to one work of the accelerator. So that is approximately six to seven thousand uh, uh, hours annually. Uh, accelerator, which uh, was uh, commissioned in s late 70s, it was again modernized, and as I said, we improved it a thousand times, and in those time, 20 years ago, it was the best accelerator in the world uh, for this, uh, for this uh, topic. Uh, Experiment was started in 1999, uh, just in the end of uh, previous century. First, what we did, that is uh, calcium-48 on plutonium-244 led to uh, uh, element-114. Uh, and immediately after, calcium on curium, which led to element-116. And just during one year, uh, we, after 20 years of unsuccessful experiments, we saw uh, that uh, after all this uh, tremendous work, we see these super heavy elements. There was only three events in those time, but it was enough to say that yes, uh, first we may produce those elements, that they exist, but even more important that what uh, we saw that uh, when we come closer to the uh, predicted island of stability, stability of those elements increase and increase uh, uh, dramatically. So you see, for example, uh, isotope which was produced in Germany, in Darmstadt, uh, has half-life uh, less than microsecond. And isotope which we produce already lives uh, half a minute. It may be not much, but the difference between that is that it's five orders of magnitude. And that is uh, one of the main indications that indeed we approach this island of stability. Uh, since then, since 1999, many reactions were tested and finally we populate this huge uh, uh, territory on the nuclear map. We succeed to discover six new elements. Uh, we uh, convince and prove that uh, this predicted island of stability exists, even not reaching, uh, reaching its center. So n nuclei which we synthesized, they how say touch the shore of this island, but we, we didn't uh, reach its center. So it's, uh, it's still uh, the task uh, for, for the future. Of course, there was uh, some uh, uh, time to celebrate yeah, this discovery, and of course, celebrate uh, when you discover element. So, discover uh, uh, celebration is con connected with naming of this element. And to name element, you should prove that y you really uh, discover it. Uh, prove uh, to the International Committee of International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry and International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. And uh, they uh, became convinced after uh, confirmation of all our experiments, independent confirmation 
in, uh, in Dubna, in Berkeley, in, in Germany, at JSI. Uh, so finally, in 2011, uh, elements 114 and 116 were recognized that they were discovered, and the year after, in 2012, they got permanent names, uh, Flerovium, after uh, Georgi Florov and Livermorium uh, for 116 because all this work in Dubna was done in collaboration with two American institutions that is Livermore and Oak Ridge National Laboratories. And uh, in 2016, uh, another three elements uh, with the priority of Dubna and uh, U.S. institutions got their names, so this Moscovium for 115, Tennessee. Uh, after a place where Oak Ridge is located for 117 and a Ganison for one element 118 named after leader of all this uh, experimental work in the world, that, uh, Professor Yuri Aganisian. And of course we are very proud to have two our scientists in the periodic table. Uh, uh, that is a record, yeah, so it's n never in the world uh, two persons working in the same laboratories are Play, uh, present in the periodic table. Uh, and uh, one more thing that uh, with Aganison, that a second time in the history when element is named after a living person. So that is um, a very rare case and just uh, as I mentioned second case uh, in the history. So uh, as I said we are very proud of that. Uh, we are not the only laboratory working in this uh, business, but uh, I should say that only four scientific centers succeed in the history to produce uh, artificially uh, with this method uh, an element. So that is Berkeley, Dubna, JSI, and Riken with one element. But if we count, uh, so we see that Dubna uh, has a record, so uh, 18 elements produced since 19. Five, uh, five, 55. Uh, for 10 of them, Dubna has full or partial priority. So Dubna is a place where approximately 10% of the periodic table was discovered. Yeah. Well, so uh, we have answered to a number of questions. So we know that super heavy elements exist. We know that island of stability exists. We know how even how to produce uh, some of these super heavy elements. But still, uh, we have uh, many, many questions. For example, where is the end and uh, how far we may go? So it's not necessary should coincide. Yeah? Uh, even when we discovered these, those elements, still we uh, don't know a lot about them. So uh, if this, this is a chemical element, so they should have chemical properties. They should make compounds uh, and so on, and uh, it is an extremely important question, what are the chemical behavior of those elements? Uh, of course, to reach the island of stability and to uh, uh, answer the question about uh, nature, if it's possible to produce those elements in nature, they are also extremely important. And of course, we think that uh, we may answer to uh, several of those questions, at least maybe not to all of them, but just to go in this way, and this was the reason to uh, construct a new accelerator complex which should be much, much better than everything existed in the world before, and we hope that, uh, not hope, but we already know that this, uh, what we did, that is a tenth of times better, at least 30, 50 times better than what we had in the world before. Uh, this center is called Super Heavy Elements Factory. Uh, the main Part of this center is a new accelerator, uh, DC-280, Dubna Cyclotron-280. So it was, uh, that is our product, I mean product of uh, our institute, our laboratory. Uh, uh, it was commissioned at the end of uh, last year, and so now it is uh, work uh, just uh, uh, every day, uh, 24 hours a day, uh, seven uh, days a week, uh, without any problem. So uh, this uh, new accelerator produce beam which is 10 times more intense than uh, the beam which we had before. That is main 
uh, ingredient of uh, increased efficiency. New separator is also uh, installed, commissioned, uh, so now we test it. Uh, to the end of the, by the end of the year, we are going to test it with uh, this reaction leading to element 115 Muscovium, which is already known, but we want to show with this experiment that everything which we made uh, work as, uh, it, as it was uh, planned. And then we are uh, uh, simultaneously preparing uh, our uh, equipment to make uh, one of the main experiments for this uh, facility, experiment for the synthesis of element 120, uh, element of uh, eighth period of the periodic table in the reaction titanium and californium. Uh, it is planned for the next year. Uh, what is the program for this new facility? I showed this slide before and you see that there's uh, many, many nuclei and many elements which we produced uh, during the last uh, uh, 20 years. So now it's time to study, to study those nuclei and those elements. And uh, this new facility, which is, as I said, uh, 30, 50 times better than uh, what we had before, is uh, just uh, was constructed uh, for, for this topic. Uh, uh, also, we, of course, want to a ex little bit expand and in, 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 a, uh, in a large known area of the nuclei and elements. As I mentioned, we are going to go uh, even for heavy elements, 119 and 120. We are going to come closer to the island of stability. It is possible. We are going uh, to uh, uh, come to the end of stability, moving in the left direction. Uh, of course, uh, here we will face with uh, extremely low uh, probability for, of, for, of synthesis of these elements. But as, again, with new facility, we hope that we will succeed. And uh, as I mentioned, one for, for my personal uh, choice, uh, one of the most interesting and uh, maybe most topical question for uh, uh, super heavy elements that is their uh, chemical properties. At the moment, it is possible to make experiment on chemistry even when you have one atom which, log which lives uh, longer than one second. Uh, the difference between conventional chemistry is that you should repeat this many times. Yeah? So in conventional chemistry, you have many atoms you may compound and you study this uh, once. In uh, this chemistry, chemistry of super heavy elements, you have one atom, but you repeat experiment many times. So that is just a difference. But with new facility, we think that we, we will, uh, we will uh, progress in this field. Uh, so that is the border, one second, and you see that the number of elements, uh, even those which are very close to the islands of stability, are uh, now open for uh, their chemical investigation. So let me summarize my talk with this picture, which uh, indeed showed, uh, sh shows um, 70 years work on producing elements uh, heavier than uranium. Yeah? Uh, again, that is a continent, yeah? that is a peninsula with uranium, different ships which uh, uh, more or less successful in uh, going to heavy and heavy elements. We have uh, here island of stability, which we think we already see this island, and we hope for, for some good future. With that, I would like to summarize and thank for you for your kind attention. Thank you. Can you please return? Can you please switch to the presentation? Okay. So that is just uh, time lapse for uh, assembling of the accelerator. So that is two minutes. And work was for two years, but uh, this movie is for two minutes.
So we have 18 member states as an international uh, organization and all parts of the, uh, this accelerator were produced by member states. It was designed, uh, calculated, uh, assembled, uh, commissioned by our local engineers, but manufacturing, of course, it is a huge work. That was the work of uh, many, many countries. That's all. Uh, thank you very much. And one additional piece of information. Alexander mentioned that the heaviest element in nature, the atomic number is 118, was given the name after Yuri Oganesian, still alive and being the scientific leader of one of the laboratories in the Joint Institute. I'm saying this because this person is a foreign member of the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts. Okay. I will be the next speaker and The optical rainbow effect appears in scattering of light in the limiting case of small wave wavelengths. We all know about that effect. When in the scattering process we have sunlight and water droplets in the ends atmosphere, one calls the effect the meteorological rainbow effect. The first explanation of uh, the effect happened in the fourth century BC and Aristotle was the one to try to study it. His explanation was wrong but anyway he was the first one to try to explain the effect. But the satisfactory quantitative theory of the effect did not come between the 20th century, believe it or not, in 1969, not before that. In the beginning of the 50s, an effect analogous to the meteorological rainbow effect was first predicted and then about 10 years after that observed experimentally. So far, the rainbows have been discovered in the scattering of nuclei by nuclei, in the scattering of atoms from crystal surfaces, and in ion transmission through crystal channels. We shall be talking here about the meteorological rainbow effect and about the rainbow effect in ion transmission through crystal channels, which has been named the crystal rainbow effect. Our main aim is to demonstrate that these phenomena are complex. This is a picture of the meteorological rainbow effect. The effect has more components, the primary, the secondary and the supernumerary rainbows. The primary rainbow, this is this rainbow, is a bright circular bow seen in the sky at an angle of about 42 degrees relative to the horizon. The secondary rainbow is another bright bow appearing in the sky on the outer side of the primary rainbow but at the angle of 50 degrees relative to the horizon. The region between the primary and secondary rainbow is dark. 
the supernumerary rainbows appear on the inner side of the primary rainbow. You see them, a number of, a number of hardly visible bows. These are the supernumerary rainbows. The first explanation of the meteorological rainbow effect was given by Descartes, but he was followed an experiment performed by Theodorico Freiburg in the beginning of the 14th century. This is a scheme of the process. This is a water droplet. This is one of the incoming rays. B denotes the so-called impact parameter. It gives you the position of the incoming ray, the initial position of the incoming ray on the water droplet boundary. Descartes calculated all possible outcoming uh, rays, light rays, and classified them in a very simple way. Number one is a ray directly reflected. Number two is a ray that went through the droplet without any reflection. Number three is the ray with, which had inside the droplet one reflection. Number four, the ray with two reflections and so on. That classification was done, as I have said, by Descartes. Now, let us see the explanation of all that. This is the called so deflection function. It gives you the scattering angle of the light ray as a function of the impact parameter. This is the impact parameter, and the scattering angle for the rays of class three is this angle. For the class from, uh, from class, uh, rays from class four is this one. If you see those dependencies, you will see that for the rays from class three, there is a minimum here and for the rays from class 4, a maximum here. This point, as well as this point, is a point of accumulation of light. That was the discovery. And the angles are 100 and 138 degrees and 130 degrees. These are the scattering angles, but the corresponding angles relative to the horizon were 40 degrees, 42 degrees and 50 degrees. That was the discovery. Those were the primary and secondary rainbow. This is the bright side of the primary rainbow. This is the dark side. In the case of secondary rainbow, this is the bright side and this is the dark side. He also noticed that in between the two accumulation points, there was no rays. And that was the Alexander's Dark Bend, the region named after Alexander the Aphrodisias. He was the first one to observe that. In uh, the, in, the in the fourth century. Descartes also noticed that the intensity of light, this is the intensity of light versus the scattering angle, that when you, are, when you go towards the rainbow angle, the intensity goes to infinity. And this is the explanation. This is the bright side. At the boundary, the intensity goes to infinity and then drops to zero. This is the beginning of the Alexander's dark, dark band. The same explanation is valid for the secondary rainbow. We all know, we all have seen many times, that a rainbow consists of a number of rows, a number of bows of different colors, from purple to red. What is the origin of that? Newton was the one to explain that. That can be attributed to the dispersion of light. But if the light is monochromatic, for example, red, the whole rainbow will stay there, but it will be red. Thus, the essential characteristic of a meteorological rainbow is not colors, but an abrupt change of the intensity of scattered light across the rainbow angle, rather than the appearance, as I have said, of the bows of different colors. However, you can see clearly in this figure that two values of the impact parameter gives one value of the scattering angle and the same thing for the secondary rainbow. 
one impact parameter, second, the first, the second, and one scattering angle. What does this mean? You have two rays at one angle. You are the observer, you see the two rays at one angle. But that means that these rays can interfere. This is something new. And that's how Young and later Airy explained the supernumerary rainbows. You see here the calculation of Airy. Instead of this, Descartes dependence, you have the primary rainbow and this, the first supernumerary rainbow. This was a very clear explanation. In parallel to that, it has been uh, determined that the abrupt change of the intensity of light scattering from above a droplet in the vicinity of this angle, it is very abrupt, but it can be modeled by catastrophe theory. Catastrophe theory is a general theory of models. That's why one may say that the rainbow effect is a catastrophic event. But as I have said, in this case, two rays can interfere. This is something you, you have at the exit more than at the entrance. This means that the supernumerary rainbow effect is a gestalt or synergistic or emergent effect. And that makes the effect complex. Carlos, listening? Yes. <laughs> Complexity means that something emerges, something you do not expect. This is a fantastic picture. I guess you have never seen anything like that. This is the full rainbow. You've seen that? <laughs> but to see that, what is the situation? The observer is in an airplane, the droplets are in front, and the sun is just behind. That's why you see the whole rainbow. You always, when you are on the earth, you see a part of it. This is a fantastic picture. You see the primary rainbow, the secondary rainbow, the Alexander dark band, and also, to a certain extent, you see the supernumerary rainbows. This is a complicated effect, but what make it, makes it complex is the supernumerary rainbows. The primary and secondary rainbows are complicated, but not complex. Let us now move to the crystal rainbows. This is a channel of a crystal. There are many strings around these four in a real crystal. These four atomic strings, one, two, three, four, define a crystal channel. You can uh, enter that channel with charged particles, for example, protons or another ions. We, uh, we, we discovered this effect in 1986 in the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. This is the impact parameter of the ion. This is the initial position of the ion in this entrance plane. This is the scattering angle. And the axes are vertical, horizontal, and longitudinal. There will be only two formulas. Do not be afraid. The ion differential transmission cross-section, sigma, being a variable determining the intensity of scattered light, is given by this very simple expression. J, 1 over J, J is a complicated function of the partial derivatives of theta x and theta y. These are the vertical and horizontal components of the scattering angle. That is what we measure. We measure theta x and theta y, and we also measure sigma, intensity. We saw, and that was our discovery, that j, sorry, that j can be zero. If j is zero, sigma goes to infinity. This is a rainbow. And for the first time, we, we, we predicted that theoretically. And the experimental observation came very soon after that in the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in 1986 and 1984. And then after that, after many years in the at the National University of Singapore in the period of from 2011 to 2014. But the crucial variable here, J, we have found that can be split into two parts. The first part is the sum of terms describing the ion scattering from the individual atomic strings, one, two, three, four. While this term, the second one, 
is a sum of terms describing the coupling between the pairs of at atomic strings as seen by the ion. The ion is an observer. It comes into the crystal and gives, brings the information out of it. Thus, the equation J equals zero, or sigma goes to infinity, defines the rainbow line in the impact parameter plane, in this plane, and in the scattering angle plane. The observation is done in the scattering angle plane. You cannot measure this line. Let us now give you a concrete example. The incoming particles are protons. The energy is seven mega electron volts. That means that uh, an ion can easily go through a thin, a thin or very thin crystal. It is a very special channel, orientation of the crystal, and the thickness is 140 nanometer. These are the four atomic strings, and this is the rainbow line in the impact parameter plane. You'll see what does that mean. If you follow the dependence of the intensity of scattered light across this line, you see two peaks, two maxima, two very high maxima, two infinities here. And these two points correspond to these two points. Now, these are the rainbow lines, the rainbow points belonging to this rainbow line. But if you cancel term J prime, the interference term, you will then obtain only this line. It clearly tells you that the rainbow effect is a consequence of coupling between the atomic strings, between uh, the consequence of interference of the atomic strings. In the case of meteorological rainbows, the rays were interfering, but here, the contributions of the atomic strings interfere, but this is interference again. And as a result, this is a gestalt, synergistic, or emergent effect. Again, the crystal rainbows are complex phenomena. This is uh, the rainbow line in the, in the observation space, four atomic strings again. This is the rainbow line. This is the bright side of the rainbow, and this is the dark side of the rainbow. It is given in white here, it should be black, but you'll see, so you'll see that in the next uh, figure. We have demonstrated in 1987 that this effect can also be modeled very successfully by catastrophe theory, and that's why we call it a catastrophic effect. This is the calculated rainbow, the rainbow line in the space in which you measure the bright side and the dark side. Now, a result of a sequence of high resolution measurements with the focused proton microbeams of energy of 2, 1.5, 1.0, and 0.7 MeV directed into, into the same channel. This is the same channel, but the energy is different. The energy here is 7 MeV, and here is as it is written here. The experiment was performed at the National University of Singapore, but ana analyzed in the Vincha Institute of Nuclear Sciences. That was the place I was working in the whole my life. You see clearly, this is a rainbow line like here. This is the bright side of the inner rainbow. This is the dark side of the inner rainbow. But this region is the dark, bright, bright side of the second rainbow, and the dark side is here. The similar situation is with uh, the results for other energies. You see that with energy, the situation changes. The rainbow lines change. But the comparison of the experiment, the experiment is yellow and the theoretical calculation is red, tells you that the rainbows appear as the skeletons of the distribution. We have compared, of course, the details of all this and the uh, comparison gives us a perfect coincidence. This is the final confirmation of the effect. This was a high technology experiment. The thickness of the crystal is uh, 55 nanometers. That means that each atomic row has 110 atoms. This is nanoscience. And the incoming beam, the diameter is one micrometer. And one micrometer is 1,000 times smaller than one millimeter. This is one millimeter. Can you imagine a beam 1,000 times smaller than this? And the guys there did that. They created the crystal. They uh, were preparing that experiment for about five years. 
the crystal, to prepare the crystal, to prepare the beam, and to register that with a very special technique. Now, I have described briefly the meteorological rainbow effect and the crystal rainbow effect. The former effect is macroscopic and the latter effect is microscopic. In the first, in the primary, in the former case, the projectiles with light, photons, and the target was a water droplet. In the latter case, the projectiles with proton and uh, the, the target a crystal. But in both cases, with them, the cases are different, but both of them are catastrophic and complex. Now a message to other researchers in the field. We have shown that a complex phenomena can be well modeled, accurately modeled, and fully understood. This is a message to other people in the field. The field is complex systems, especially to those researchers in the field of social sciences. Do not be afraid. We understand that. We can understand that. What we need is the following, to understand the components totally and to try to model the interaction or the connection between that. That might give a result. Thus, please follow the results in physics and in other natural sciences. This is a message to social sciences, to Carlos, for example. <laughs> but a result may come. You cannot apply that directly. Follow the results, and if appropriate, you may take an idea from that. Thank you very much. Okay, we are continuing the session. The next speaker is Professor Fadwa El Gindi. She comes from the American University of Cairo in, e in Egypt. And she will talk about multiculturalism or, uh, and interculturalism. Please, the floor is yours. Let me begin with a brief introduction about the human universe. And then I'll follow that by some comments on a few slides I prepared for this talk. Then conclude with some ideas for, um, in the context of multiculturalism versus interculturalism, the topic of the talk, uh, perhaps applicable to innovating education. There are five points I want to make about the character of the social universe. Whereas the natural world is regulated by physical laws, living organisms by biological laws, the human universe, by comparison, is chaotic. And it needs the human mind in its evolved creative capacity uh, qualitatively unique in the animal world to impose order on this chaos. It does so by integrating elements, domains, spaces, and it puts them together into a unified, coherent sociocultural universe, which is then transmitted by cultural means in society. Now, cultural means can be formal education, but it's also storytelling, family socialization, or a combination of all of them. All of these are how cultures um, and uh, knowledge is transmitted. This is carried over across generations for millennia. As an example, ancient Egyptians imposed order creatively and dynamically by turning elements from the natural world, the social world, the cultural world, and built a coherent vision integrating life, death, gender, the animal world, the idea of deity, the cosmos, family, earth, which is by the way in ancient Egypt is male, not female, you know, mother earth type thing. It's the earth is male, and the sky is female, governance, justice, 
morality and much more. So let me show you a, a slide here. I've shown that before, but not in, um, to this audience. Uh, here we have this beautiful goddess, Matt. She represents stability. And the, if it's not Matt, the opposite of Matt would be Isfet, who represents chaos, meaning evil, violence, injustice. And if you look at Matt, we have, she has the feather, the ankh, life, and the scepter, governance. And in order for the Egyptians to give order to their universe, they put a balance among all of these. You cannot have governance without justice, and you cannot have justice without life. And life is a harmony between nature, culture, gender, cosmos, all together. And uh, the stability comes about from this balance of these universes. So this is used, or has been used, as a guiding worldview. They consider it a worldview to build their uh, societies, but mostly to build the first unified nation state in our civilization history. And as this audience already knows, quite a remarkable civilization. This is a, there are some variants on this worldview, but this was very uh, fundamental. The second point is that each era and every age since our human beginnings experiences new normalities. We are talking about new normalities as if they are new. And that new normalities are always resisted because they challenge people's comfort zones. So we have new changes, they confront the comfort zones of people, and you find resistance. And number three, perhaps not obvious, but cultures and societies are always changing. So we, we think that we have to introduce change. Societies are naturally changing all the time, but they are changing at very small paces that can be absorbed by the people. Only when change is forced on society or is imposed upon the people, whether from the inside or the outside, or when it is entered too rapidly, does it lead to dissonance and instability. And there are many societies where change came too fast and destabilization takes place. Number four. To innovate, and here we, of course, are, we are talking about education, we do need insights from wherever we can get them, but definitely we should not leave out the historical past, the knowledge, the models, the insights from our historical past. However, looking at our past is not about turning back the clock. It's not a matter of nostalgia. We're not sitting here saying, let's do what the ancient Egyptians did. Things are changing. There are technological advances. There are new challenges. But we should seek insights in models and experiments at every level of human development. So we have models by um, ancient civilizations, and we can analyze them, and seek ideas and insights, not necessarily copy the model. The fifth point, to build a new paradigm for education, we need to situate innovation within cultural tradition to preserve cultural uniqueness, rather than a one-size-fits-all, which tends to homogenize, and we don't want a homogenized world. The focus, uh, on the other hand, we don't want endless diversity either. We need to identify commonalities. And we seek commonality without homogenizing. 
we respect difference and diversity without compromising uniqueness. The sixth point, rather than a discontinuous fragmented dichotomous model of disparate elements, we can bring its parts together in a pattern of dynamic, interactive, interconnectedness to form an integrated whole. So, instead of asking how do we change education so that the people can uh, be trained um, in a way that is compatible with the new technology so that they find jobs, we ought to be reminding ourselves that we as humans invented technology and we invented it the way it is. And we created it for our use. So we should be able, using the same minds, to imaginatively humanize it in such a way as to meet our needs in the emerging global world. Uh, and I'm not referring to uh, after you make a robot, you uh, start uh, looking for this very fashionable word emotion, and you put emoticons uh, to the robot to create emotion. That's not what I'm referring to. We humanize technology to meet our needs instead of robotizing humans to fit technology. So now let me connect these insights to multiculturalism and interculturalism. It's presented as if it's a polarity. So I ask myself, is it really a polarity? And in order to seek answers for this, I'll have to journey back a little, all the way to the third century BC in Alexandria, to 8th century Cordoba, to 9th century Baghdad, and to 11th century Cairo. Uh, we have the, you all heard of the Great Library of Alexandria, the third and second centuries BC, the Great Library of Cordoba, of the Umayyad dynasty in Andalusia, which was 756 to 1031. The Umayyads were the first Muslim dynasty that was established in Damascus in 661. There are many more academies. I just mentioned a few uh, major points. But I want to focus on two of these, Beit al-Hikmah of Baghdad and Dar al-Ilm of Cairo. Uh, Beit al-Hikmah was the early 9th century. Dar al-Ilm was, much, was later 1005 CE. I like this quote. There are many um, uh, comments made by scholars about these early um, academies, but I like that uh, particular small piece of a quote, shelves, and this is referring to Dar al-Ilm of Cairo, shelves in 40 cabinets, each could accommodate about 18,000 books, etc., etc. It gives you a sense of what it looked like. This is a depiction of Dar al-Ilm, or the House of Knowledge, at 10.05 um, in Cairo. This is a depiction, but it gives you a sense of all these scholars in one place. And they are scholars from all fields and of all uh, the uh, nationalities of the region at the time, which is from the Arabs, from Central Asia, India, Persia, and so on. And there were men and women uh, as long as they are scholars and have curiosity and are interested, they would be in this place. Of course, there was the wisdom of the leadership at the time that was accumulating the information and the knowledge and made it accessible to scholars so that they sit and think and invent and um, exchange ideas. Uh, dar means house in a large sense house uh, in many households. Al-ilm in Arabic could be science or could be knowledge. It's a combined idea, science and knowledge. Beit al-Hikmah, Beit is house, but in a smaller sense, Beit al-Hikmah of Baghdad, house of wisdom, early 9th centuries, earlier, and it's my favorite. Um, 
Beit means house, al hikma means wisdom, but it also could be science and scholarship and knowledge. The depiction uh, to the left is, uh, again, a scholar sitting with a library behind them, sort of gives you an idea of what it looked like, and some are reading and some are discussing. And um, the uh, um, picture to, to my right um, is, um, I think it's a cover of a book called 1001 Nights, but it's uh, Inventions. <laughs> And it's uh, still, it, it gives a good sense of what it was like, people standing around and sitting and reading and translating. They were translating Greek knowledge, but they were inventing and creating. There was an observatory there, and there was science, and there was discovery, and was invention, and publication, and printing. All this, all this knowledge came to us, this was during the, uh, golden age of Islam, which was the dark ages of Europe. Once uh, Europe came out of its dark ages and started building its uh, industrial revolution, they already had that knowledge to build on. So to go to multiculturalism and interculturalism, um, I look at elements that are common in all these classic academies. They are gathering places of both teaching and learning. You can't really distinguish. They sit and teach each other, but also are learning. Uh, there is knowledge exchange. There is research sharing. There is translation, because they felt that it's important to build knowledge. And if there is knowledge existing before the knowledge that they are discovering, it should be translated and should be acquired. The common language at the time was Arabic. So all these people coming from different parts of the world were dealing with knowledge in Arabic. There was printing, reading, documentation. Uh, academy and university is combined. Library and archive is combined. Curious scholars across ethnicities and faiths, Muslims, Christians, Jews, and others were all sitting together there discussing uh, knowledge. Uh, many cultural traditions, but what brought them together was this knowledge. Uh, the observatory, of course, was put in there in that uh, academy for discovery and invention, so you can imagine some scholar going up and watching the stars and coming up with an idea and coming back to his colleagues who are from a very different field, and they're all exchanging that. But there was also music, and art, and poetry, and philosophy. It wasn't just pure uh, science. Uh, as I said, Arabs, Persians, Indians, Slavs, Muslims, Christians, Jews, all faiths, all sects were together. Teaching and learning was integrated with research and discovery, innovation, and recording, that is archiving. So, when I look at multiculturalism, I look at very different shaped objects uh, together in form. But when I look at interculturalism, where we have uh, exchange, integration, we not only get a very powerful aesthetic here, but there is an inner structure to that kind of Islamic art. There is a logic behind it. So interculturalism and the exchange of knowledge the, brings about a new form, a new idea, a pattern of interrelatedness and a beautiful form. Whereas multiculturalism, it exists um, altogether, different shapes, but nothing will happen until the form turns into a process, until the quantity becomes quality, until the sum of parts, which is static, becomes interactive energy and dynamic pattern. So, 
um, the multiculturalism with many ethnicities, cultures, traditions, faiths, and fields sounds like a good idea, but is it enough? And is it part of a polarity, or do we have to see both together? The exchange, the sharing, and the building of knowledge. So if we translate uh, some of these ideas to um, innovation in education, I would think that we have to follow two pursuits. We have to build minds, not just train for skills. And I think this was said over and over in some, uh, not directly train for skills, but build minds as well. Um, knowledge creation. We have to combine the library with the research institutes. I think we lost that in the new architecture of universities where you have to walk several miles to the library and then sign in and sign out and things like that. It ha research has to be integrated with the library work so that, you know, we do labs in the library, for instance. Uh, students have to have access to uh, research uh, and uh, the existing knowledge to read. Uh, sharing and transmitting of knowledge, teaching in the library. Some people now, uh, some um, teachers in the United States are experimenting with taking the students to the library and holding their classes there so that they will have access to the books and take the books down from the shelves and use them. So the two paths need to be integrated, the skills for the market plus the building of the mind. We cannot leave out the building of the mind. So uh, education and innovation must be grounded in cultural tradition. It must be informed by the nation's level of development, demographic, population size, values, identity, we forget that. We have some good models of education, but if we take them as they are and try to apply them to a different situation, it might not work. I would say it won't work. Even the Finnish example, where we say Finland has the best education system, if I take it to Egypt today, it will fail. Different people, different size population, we're taking 100 million, as opposed to how many in Finland? And then a, a homogeneous, uh, society as a very complex society. So we have to identify the elements, build different uh, templates, and perhaps have templates for this kind of society, another template for this kind of society, but all of them uh, having the integration of elements in it. So, to repeat and conclude, we need to humanize technology because we have the mind to do it. Uh, once technology is there and we are very impressed by all that's happened, we make it happen. It's humans who are sitting in the lab discovering rainbows and the rainbow technology. So if we have that mind, why aren't we using it to humanize technology, and I mean seriously humanized technology, not to put uh, smileys, uh, humanized technology in the sense of make it serve our needs. And hard science does serve our needs. We cannot say no, we have to go and borrow a term from here, a term over there, and get a, a mix that is diluted. All of these fields are part of our future and we need it for our universe, but we need to humanize it. We cannot become robotized human, which is beginning to happen even when you are not using a machine. Some people at the, in a grocery store talk like they are robots already. They repeat words, thank you, yes, they don't really mean it, and so on, we are becoming robotized. We have to avoid that, and we can only do it with our human mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fadwa. And now, the final speaker in this session, Professor Chen Yang Li. He comes from the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore.
please. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me see. Not to work. Oh, yes, to my water. Uh, am I controlling this? I remember the 24, 21. Yeah, this one, okay, good, 21. Okay, my topic is related to a lot of talks I have heard uh, in these uh, two days. Uh, I'm talking about the Confucian education uh, as civic education. I changed the word from and to s to make it a little bit stronger connection uh, to the theme of the conference. So um, my talk has mainly two parts. One is uh, to introduce, explain Confucian education, what it is about and uh, the, uh, the content, and then uh, make a connection uh, between Confucian education with a civic education. Uh, in Confucian philosophy, uh, education is usually expressed in the term of jiao xue, the two terms used together. And the uh, first word jiao literally means teaching or educating others. Xue means learning or educating oneself. The two terms are often coupled together to refer to education in a general sense, and uh, that shows the connection between learning and teaching. Now, uh, education occupies a central place in Confucian philosophy. An earlier Confucian thinkers were teachers, and uh, when they established the philosophy, they put education at the very center of their philosophy. On the Confucian uh, conception, a human person is not a biological concept. We are not born a full person. Humanity is something we develop something we cultivate, we gain in our educational process. So there's a passage from the Confucian classics, the Book of Rights on learning. There is a section, there is a chapter on learning. It says that jade does not become a product without a carving. People do not understand the Tao without learning. Therefore, ancient kings placed jiao and xue, teaching and learning, as a top priority when they established the state and ruled the people. Earlier Confucians in the classical period think that human societies were established by those wise people they called the sage kings. And when they established society, they put education as a top priority. Learning is the first word of Confucius' Analects, the book that records Confucius' sayings. That's the indication of how learning is taken so seriously in the Confucian tradition. And the Confucius said that as human beings, we are born similar. However, it is through learning we become different. Some people learn more than others. Then gradually we create a distance between different people. Some people learn better, become more virtuous, better educated. Others are less so. So that's how people become different in society. We, we are born with the same potential but how we realize the potential is not always the same for each person. 
Mencius, the second greatest Confucian thinker in ancient times, uh, used the analogy of a plant. He says that when we were born, we each have this seed in us, this sprout in us, that allows us to grow in the full development, full cultivation of the, our humanity. However, we need to cultivate those seeds, the sprout, in order to, to gain full humanity out of us. Now Confucius, when he summarized his own lifetime, uh, his uh, um, uh, life experience, he said that at 15, I set my heart on learning. That was the earliest uh, hallmark uh, major stage in his life stages. Until he said, until when he reached 70, he felt free uh, to do anything he wished without crossing any boundaries. And that means he, feel, he, feel, he feels he's fully cultivated. He also put, you know, Confucian ethics is usually taken as virtue ethics. Ethics is focusing on cultivating human virtues. And Confucius himself takes the love of learning as a very important virtue. In the Analects, the concept of uh, love of learning or fun of learning uh, appears many times in many different sections throughout the book of Analex. And uh, when Confucius talked to his students, he is believed to have, uh, had, to have, uh, to have had uh, over 3,000 students throughout his lifetime. When he talked to his students, he said, uh, I'm not better than other people in many other ways, but I'm very much in love with learning with learning. So learning is an important uh, virtue that Confucius wants to demonstrate for his students. Now, we can note a few features of Confucian learning. First, Confucian learning is not merely about acquiring theoretical knowledge, nor merely book learning. Learning is about improving oneself to become a better person. The primary purpose of learning is not to earn a comfortable uh, life. It is about learning to be an all-rounded, productive person for a good life in society. Second feature, learning is, not, is by no means a passive process of absorbing knowledge or information. It is rather an active endeavor to pursue knowledge and to acquire experience and skills. In his teaching, he encouraged, Confucius encouraged his student to come up with three uh, cases when he presented one case. He said, if I show you a square and point to one corner, if you cannot point, find out three other corners, we cannot go on. I cannot continue teaching you. So student initiative is important in his pedagogy. Third, learning is not a one-directional dire affair. Uh, rather, it's a kind of a two-way street between the teacher and the learner. Confucius should learn from his students while his students learn from him. And Confucius believed that uh, if there are three people working together, at least you will find one person who can teach you something. So uh, you can always learn from others. Confucius was among the very first in human history to advocate education regardless of a family background, without social classes. And the time he started uh, spreading his philosophy in China, mainly education was controlled by the state, it was for the state. And um, uh, for 
you know, children of state uh, officials. And Confucius advocated the idea that everybody deserves a chance to be educated. And that idea later uh, generated a great impact in China. And the later, the civil service uh, examination practice is traceable directly to that idea that everybody has the potential to become a productive uh, person in society. In terms of uh, Confucian curriculum, in his time, his uh, school curriculum uh, included mainly these six uh, items, rights, uh, in Chinese the term li. This term needs a little bit of inter interpretation. Uh, the, sometimes it's, it's translated in English as ritual proper variety. It's, it's kind of basically, uh, in English, you will find many terms covering uh, aspect of it. We talk about the rice ceremony, we talk about the protocol, we talk about the etiquette, uh, we talk about uh, civility, we talk about uh, you, uh, you know, act with respect. All these things are covered in this broad concept of Li. Then music. Music was a major uh, item uh, he taught. Archery. Of all sport uh, skills, archery was chosen in part because Confucius believed that uh, this is a, a special kind of a sport. When you shoot an arrow, you miss the target. You don't blame others. You re reflect on yourself. What did I not do right? What I can do to improve? So there is a uh, that uh, consideration in that item of archery. And uh, trivial tearing has to do with uh, military training and uh, 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 some skills in case you need to serve the state. Calligraphy, of course, that has a long there is a long tradition in China about calligraphy. And uh, finally, mathematics. Uh, mathematics is... Um, also an important thing. As you can see, uh, in back in those days, there was no science in it. And um, uh, some people argue that later China did not develop a science as well as the West, perhaps because Confucian curriculum did not have science. Uh, you can equally argue that at that time, there was basically no science. To, to include, to be included here. Some of his disciples uh, classified the teaching, uh, the, the, what they learned from Confucius in four categories. One is the cultural refinement. And Confucius uh, very much emphasized the need for a person to uh, to be refined culturally, to become a part of a culture. And we were born, we basically have no culture. And we need to learn the culture to become a part of the culture. And the proper conduct, and that has to do with the earlier the concept that I mentioned, Li. You behave well, you interact with the people in a polite way with respect and be considerate etc., etc. And then, uh, dedication. Whatever you choose to do, you set your heart on it and do it well. Be persistent. And trustworthiness. And trustworthiness is an important virtue uh, in the Confucian tradition as well. So uh, this is one way for his disciple to summarize you can imagine different disciples may have a different ways to summarize his teaching. But this example shows some of the uh, key items that Confucius valued in his uh, teaching. Now, 
Now we can see that the learning and the teaching are two aspects of Confucian philo philosophy of education. Learning is for individual persons to observe knowledge, to develop social skills, and to become virtuous. Teaching is for those with knowledge and experience to help others grow. Of the two aspects of education, learning and teaching, Confucius advocates that one should learn insensibly and teach others tirelessly. For him, learning without teaching becomes blind. Teaching without learning is futile. Learning and teaching strengthen each other. Such a mutual dependency can be found in the same person. When, we, we, when a person both learn and teach. It can also be between, be, be between different people, between students and teachers. In learning, students not only improve themselves, they can also help their teachers to improve. The same can be said of teachers. When these two functions work together in mutual support and mutual enhancement, society can successfully reproduce good members for uh, its future. And the virtuous people will result through teaching and learning. So that's a brief summary of Confucian's uh, philosophy of education. The second part, I want to make a connection to the Confucian philosophy of education uh, with, um, uh, with a civic education. If you look at the Confucian education from the perspective of civic education, you can see quite a bit of analogy with the ancient Greek practice. In ancient Greek, there is uh, this uh, agenda to reproduce people, uh, citizens, for the poly to become good citizens of society. Now, if we look at the Confucian philosophy of education from that angle, then the question is, what can Confucian philosophy of education contribute to civic education in democratic societies, especially in East Asian societies? If we wish to educate people for productive and responsible citizens, uh, then we need to think about, uh, on the side of a civic education, what should be included in the curriculum, how we should teach our students. And this is, uh, in philosophy, this is a contentious issue because people don't agree on what uh, educators should include in their teaching. And uh, liberals tend to think that uh, at the most in school we should teach only public virtues and private, vir private virtues should be left to students themselves. And in this regard, Confucian philosophy does not make a clear separation between private virtues and public virtues. And they think these two kinds of virtues are closely related. For future, future uh, good citizens of society, they will need both public virtues and uh, private virtues. First, morality itself is relational. As long as one lives in society, there is no virtue that is completely isolated from others. In real life, so-called vir private virtues directly or indirectly affect uh, a person's social uh, participation, which is required by democratic uh, society. And private virtues have a public dimension to it. Where some virtues, such as, such as respect and tolerance, 
are more directly relevant to civic participation. Other virtues may relate to public life indirectly. They are also relevant. Second, in democratic participation, we cannot separate the right from the good sharply. There are some differences, but we still cannot separate them. As far as the virtues are virtues, because they are conducive to the good life in the community in which one lives. Strictly speaking, what is considered as right, this is from a Confucian perspective, is also a form of good in society. Political freedom is a civic right. For example, it is also an important good in society. In this sense, civic education of civil rights is also a promotion of an important common good. Now, speaking of civic participation, civil participation, one important virtue for effective participation in democratic processes is civility, is the civility. John Rawls put a civility as a primary virtue uh, in, for democratic society. In this regard, I think Confucian philosophy of education uh, can contribute uh, quite a lot because it's the idea of uh, Li, the concept I mentioned earlier, which is a thick notion and packed with uh, practice of civility in interacting with others. A person who is cultivated well in Li will be equipped well in interacting with others in a civic way. Yeah. Uh, in a civil way. And that is especially important in contemporary Western society and probably Eastern society when there is a big uh, divide, divide in society. We need to talk to each other in order to, um, in order to work together, to understand together. And um, that, in that regard, the Confucian uh, philosophy of education has a lot to contribute because it is the primary virtue for Confucians. Now, here is a list of important aims or goals for Confucian education or philosophy in the Confucian classic text called Greater Learning. Greater Learning is uh, in contrast with uh, smaller learning or lower type of learning. Greater Learning is more about being uh, prepared for good, good citizenship in society. And more has more to do with virtue. It includes these eight items. This is a list that comes from over 2,000 years ago. Investigate things. That's about knowledge we need to find out about the world. And extend the knowledge. You find the things, you, you dig deeper and find out more about it. And uh, develop a, a broader web of knowledge. And you need to have a good will. Good will for yourself and a good will towards others. And set your, your heart right. Now, uh, Confuci in Confucian virtues, uh, equally important with Li is the concept of Ren. Ren is humanity, humanis, or uh, empathy, sympathy, compassion, translated in different ways, and it covers a broad range of things. Setting the heart right is to have the right attitude towards other human beings, and you gain humanity of your own in treating others in the right way. And you continue to cultivate your person to improve yourself to develop virtues, and you uh, regulate family. This item is primarily in ancient time for men, for, for the head of a household. And uh, there is probably, arguably, 
some sexist bias there, I think. And um, today, we need to take a look at that, that sentence and uh, think about what to, to do with it. Then, participate in, uh, in government. And the Chinese civil service examination has a lot to do with that idea. But uh, I have been arguing that in democratic uh, times, uh, the primary goal for responsible students is not to serve in the government, rather to participate in democracy, to contribute to political process, to help the nation to go, the country, the society, to go in the right direction. And finally, to achieve harmony in the world, in that world. Now, why do I think a Confucian philosophy of education uh, can make a good contribution to civic education in today's democratic societies, even in multicultural societies? I think one important line to be drawn in contemporary multicultural societies is on religion. Because religion reaches the deepest level of human existence, it defines the human's identity in the most fundamental way. In today's multicultural society, civic education should be promoted in a non-sectarian fashion. In this regard, Confucian education is particularly suitable in working with other cultural traditions in promoting civic values uh, in a religious neutral way. And my argument in this regard is twofold. First, although Confucianism has its own religious components, it is not a religion. Confucius was agnostic of gods and avoided discussing religion, supernatural things with his students. In this regard, Confucianism is free from the most divisive element between religions. Second, and more important, we should make a conceptual distinction between Confucian values in the sense that the values that Confucius endorsed on the one hand, and the Confucian values in the sense of values possessed exclusively by Confucians. The latter category hardly exists. So when we talk about the Confucian values, we are talking about the values endorsed by Confucian philosophy. It's not monopolized by Confucian philosophy. The value system we call the Confucian is not unique to Confucianism, even though they are endorsed by Confucianism. They can equally endorsed by other cultural traditions as well, as well. As we can see in the eight aims in the Confucian classics, the great learning, I imagine many different cultures can endorse these goals, even though they may not articulate exactly the same way or order them the same way. So in that regard, I think is non-religious background, or very, very little religious background, and is value are mostly common values. These are two accounts, uh, two accounts make a Confucian philosophy education a good candidate for today's civic education in particularly East Asian societies. In Singapore, I think the government is promoting values in terms of common values. Singapore is a multicultural, multi-religious society. But if you read the values, you can see basically every value on the list you can find in Confucian philosophy. Now, in closing, before closing, I do want to mention that Confucianism is an ancient tradition. It is a continually living tradition. 
As any other major world cultural tradition, Confucianism has its, his own historical baggages. And there are elements in Confucianism, the way it was articulated are no longer relevant. Specifically, Confucianism has had a strong dose of sexism, and that is no longer uh, something we will embrace, and Confucianism has to, to, uh, to change in, on that account. And also, uh, the idea of filial morality, your duty toward your parents, and historically interpreted, the way historically interpreted Confucianism put a, a larger burden on children, maybe too much on children. And today, in our liberal society, we probably will not go with it. So there is perhaps a more balanced uh, place of obligations within the family. So this things that Confucianism needs to, uh, to change. And many contemporary Confucian thinkers are doing that uh, revision, basically. So in conclusion, I want to say that today we live in a democratic society, uh, in democratic societies, in a multicultural uh, social settings, and uh, we need to figure out how to promote civic education, and we need to draw from cultural resources, and Confucianism has a lot to offer in that regard. That is my presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Lang. I'm now closing this session, the last plenary session within the conference. We shall have